today we're going to talk about food safety, the U.S. compliance, and the detention without physical examination, DWPE. Um, this is fairly new. <clears throat> People have wondered why they get on this list. And part of, you're going to see some slides that you saw from before, but I think they're appropriate to readdress here a little bit. The reality is that countries are getting product from all over the world. And just in one pizza, there could be 35 ingredients from 60 countries on five continents. And what you buy this week might not be the same as next week because they're looking at least cost and they're shopping for what is available. So there is a huge market for retail out there and hopefully we can address some of the needs so that Lebanon becomes more part of this pizza that we are all putting together around the world. I encourage you to look at who your codex people are. You've got a codex contact person and you've also got a vice chair. Um, I would hope that you would get a hold of them because if you look at the codex Lebanon attendance, you will see that actually Lebanon has not participated much in Codex Alimentarius. Codex is something that is necessary. It is the basis for trade. They are the one putting the standards together for what your product has to be if there is a trade dispute. And as processors, you can participate in Codex. So I suggest you get a hold of your Codex people. You offer a lot of these um, committees now are meeting um, online. So you do not even have to go there um, to Rome or wherever um, but to participate in this. And as you can see, one of them is the food import and export inspection certification. I think this is important. Um, Lebanon has not been there since 2018. And actually they've only been there three times since 2014. So depending on what your product is, what some of your issues are, I suggest that you get a hold of Codex and you offer to participate and be put on some of these committees. The EU rejections, as you can see, most countries have um, this can be multiple reasons. It can be because you are exporting more. It can be because you have some issues. It can be because the rules have changed some. But as you can see, over the last few years, the rejections have increased. The US, this is the recent rejections from uh, the FDA refusals. Um, you know, we're looking at unsafe color, salmonella, misbranding, poisonous, filthy, um, labeling, and no process or alteration. So I think it is important that we look at how this works with the detention without physical examination. This is a matter that these violations could be related to the product, it could be the manufacturer, it could be the shipper, or there could be other information that would cause this product to be detained. So the purpose of this is that you're going to prevent volatile pro um, products from being distributed in the United States. You're, we're hoping, <coughs> excuse me, we're hoping to free up agency resources to look at other shipments. So they're using the DWPE more. We're looking to provide uniform coverage across the country. But I think the most important thing for processes in Lebanon to know is we're placing the responsibility back on the importer to ensure that the products being imported into the United States are in compliance with FDA's laws and regulations. So here is a recent screenshot from the FDA of rejections. As you will see, there is a whole list of detention without physical examination. It says due to microbiology um, contamination, um, undeclared colors, filth, presence of 
pesticides, presence of salmonella, presence of sulfide. And one of the first things that jumps out is like, how can they know this if they haven't um, examined it? Well, we're going to talk about the ways that they're coming to the decision of who's put on this. And this is basically a red list. So you have to learn how to import, um, interpret this import alert. It's just like the import alerts uh, that we had before for rejections that we talked about with the labeling. But this goes a little bit further and it's in a little different format, but not a lot. It's gonna have the number of the alert. It's gonna have the date that it's published. It's going to be um, a type, you know, is it detention without physical examination or detention without physical examination with surveillance? And so they're actually in surveillance, we're actually acting, asking for additional guidance for the field. So it's going to be, we're looking for heavy metal levels and fruit juices. This is something that is important to Lebanon because part of those heavy metals is arsenic, which um, apples quite often have an issue with. It gives the import name. It gives the reason for the alert, the guidance, what may um, provide guidance on how to be removed from this alert, the product description, the charge, the countries, it could be an area wide, it could be a country. Um, so this is something to look at. It might not have anything to do with your specific product, but more to do with the area in which you're importing from or the country you're importing from. It lists the firms and their products subject to detention, and it lists the firms and their products that have met the criteria for exclu exclusion from this. So in the import alert, it might also tell you that some of the people, if this say is an area wide or country wide, there might be people on the green list that can continue to export because they've met the expectations of the FDA. Now, when it comes to the category of import, that's what we were talking about. If you happen to be within a country or an area wide, um, there are some countries that have continually have issues for food safety, and so the FDA has decided we're just going to put them on the red list until they can prove to us that they have learned how to take care of food contamination and we can trust the product again. It might be the manufacturer, and it might be just a specific product of that manufacturer. So this is many manufacturers do multiple products. So we could say that manufacturer has a bad history of food safety. And so any product from them might be detained or it could be his other products have proven to be good, but this specific product is not being done well um, when it comes to food safety. It might not be the product or the manufacturer, it might be the shipper. So say you're shipping seafood and the shipper is not put it into cooling units or something like that. And so they have decomposition. Um, and so they have caused a violation that's beyond what the manufacturer or the product is about. It's about the shipping of it. And there again, it can be country or worldwide. We have um, a worldwide alert for puffer fish. We have too many people that have ingested it. It has been fatal. And therefore, puffer fish are not allowed within the United States to be shipped in. Now, the type of the list, here we go. We have a red list, we have a green list, and we have a yellow list. Hopefully, we try to get on the green list. Um, these have met the criteria uh, for the exemption. They have chosen to do food safety well and to become known for their food safety going through inspections or having good high step plans. We have people on the red list and those are subject to the detention without physical examination under the import alert. So if this has come up, 
your food is not going to be accepted. They're going to look at that label on the box and they're going to say, nope, that company's on the red list. Now, you might be on the yellow list. Now, this is ones that we haven't totally said we're going to put on the red list, but they're subject to intensified surveillance. So the FDA identifies foreign facilities that have food safety controls in place to control the toxin or to control the contaminants, but we are looking at them for surveillance. It hasn't gotten bad enough yet that we're looking at the red list, but the important thing is you have to respond to this. In the past, quite often, companies said, oh, well, we had a shipment that didn't get accepted, and now we're going to move forward. Well, the reality is, if you have a shipment that's not been accepted, you have been under surveillance for any reason, you need now to respond to that, or you will end up on the red list. So each import alert describes the conditions that may result in the firm being subject. What is the reason that your firm or your product did not meet the criteria? It could be that the FDA has sampled your product and it's tested for a pathogen. It could be that it sampled your product and they found illegal colors or food additives. Um, it might have been tested and pesticides didn't meet the tolerance levels. Or it might just be like we were just talking about that you were on the yellow list, you were under surveillance and you did not provide evidence to support adding you to the green list. There was no verification. You know, with the FDA, we have to worry about unapproved new drugs. Sometimes this comes into food because we say things like it is a health food, it um, has um, a health food claim that can be under unapproved new drugs. So even if it's a food, it can be um, put to the side because it's considered an unapproved new drug based on what you've put on the label. Um, you might have uh, had a bad inspection by the FDA, or you might have refused inspection by the FDA. When you sign the papers with the FDA, you are telling them that they can do an inspection of your facility. So in order for the FDA to consider removing your product or your firm from the detention without physical examination, the FDA needs evidence that the conditions that gave rise to your violation have been resolved. There's no particular form to complete when petitioning for removal from the detention. Everybody says, you know, just tell us what the list is and show us the form we need to do. There isn't one. But you can petition and you need to outline the corrective actions and the steps taken by the firm to prevent this problem. I did get a hold of a lawyer that I know that works with food safety issues. I said, what is it since there is not a particular form, what needs to be put on this? And basically it comes down to, you need to show them that you know what the problem is you know how to correct the problem and you have taken corrective actions. So this is the, um, the website for the FDA's import alerts so that you can look this up and see where your product might be because like we said before, it might not have anything to do with your company or with your product, but that doesn't mean that it is not on the red list. So they are asking, and I could not get a clarification for this, that they want the last five entries that were shipped and found no, that you were not in violation. And for each entry, they want your invoice, your packing list, your bill of landing, and your customs form. But this is the email that you have to put your petition to for removal from the list and I have added it to the website. And when you get a copy of this PowerPoint, you will have it at your disposal. Though not mandatory, um, you should include the following information on your cover sheet. 
asking to be taken off the list. It's a statement requesting the importer, the manufacturer, the shipper, or the product to be removed. And we talked about that this could be beyond your control, but you have to address which person is at fault here that has put you on the red list. They want to know the import alert number of that so they can look it up, make sure who is responsible, provide the name and address of the manufacturer or grower, and list the entry numbers of released shipments to show that you have a history that you haven't always been in default, and perhaps it's not you at all, it's your shipper or your importer, and you need to show, I have had shipments released in the past, and I'm asking for um, an exception to be put on the green list because this isn't my issue. So the process for reviewing the removal of those petitions, um, they're based on a first in, first out basis. So you have to wait your turn depending on how many people have submitted these petitions. Um, they can take up to 30 days to process, and so the time will fluctuate, but they will send you a letter um, when a decision is made, and those denial letters will include an explanation or reason for the denial, and approval letters will include FDA notice to field officers. So it automatically will go to the field for any import and tell the field officers that you have been removed from the red list to the green list. And the approvals are effective immediately. So, but the decision letter closes the case. So it's not like, oh, maybe they'll reconsider. Nope, it is that letter has determined that. If you have other information, then you need to reapply and start over again. Some of the reasons for a denial of your petition is a failure to submit the steps the firm has taken to correct the violations. Here we go back again to the fact that what the FDA wants to know, do you understand what the violation is, how it can be corrected, and what steps have you taken to correct that violation? We're going to talk about what that means and how you can submit that um, a little bit here. And the failure to submit um, the entry de uh, documentation that shows your shipping history. Have you a long history? Are you a new person? Have you had shipments that have been accepted before? Um, and any failure to submit other information that has been required by your import alert. And if you have more product failures, and if you're staging shipments, remember they were asking for five shipments. So if you're breaking up large shipments into smaller ones to count for more than one, or you're shipping small quantities of product as opposed to your historical size. So they're looking to see if you're trying to get a, around this and, and you know maybe shipping in different quantities and seeing if you can get some past the inspection. So if you have a product on the dock that could be reconditioned or could be fixed for misbranding, this is where you would go to get the form and you would fill this form out and you have two attempts to do this. Now you do have to understand that this is all going to take some time. So if the product that you have setting on the dock is um, time sensitive, I don't know that you might have times for two uh, separate proposals that you are willing to do this. There again, if you need to recondition it, you are going to have to have someone who is willing to work on your product to change the branding on it, but there is not a third attempt. You get two attempts and that's it. And these are the websites to get those downloads of filling that out. And I would suspect that you should have this on hand, put it on your company computer, and if you need it, it will be there. You can fill out your company information ahead of time. And that way you can react a lot more quicker. 
So how do you prove to the US that you're controlling contaminants and your products meet applicable FDA standards? You need an ongoing HACCP plan. You need to show that you're implementing hygiene and good manufacturing practices. And you can use in-house testing showing that your critical control points are being met. So all these things go together in your ongoing HISAP plan. A lot of people think of HISAP as a processing um, program, but it's actually applicable to all segments of the food industry, from those that are growing it, to harvesting it, to processing it, to manufacturing it, to distributing, to merchandising, and in the preparation of this. So as you can see, you can be put on the list or multiple people could be put on the list depending on where they are within the food industry. So each one of these have guidelines that they are supposed to have. So such as you're saying in the processing or the manufacturing of it, you've gotten your product from somebody growing it or harvesting it. You need a letter from them. What are they doing in regards to food safety? How is it being monitored? Um, how is the safety conditions being met? These all become part of your HISAP plan. So the definition of HISAP is a systematic approach to the identification, evaluation, and control of food safety hazards. It's a written document that says the procedures that you follow to make sure that you have safe food. It is a program. It's not just the plan that's written out. It is a program that's implementing the HISAP plan. So based on common sense application of technical and scientific principles to the production process from farm to fork, so it focuses on the hazards, not the product quality, but on the hazards of food safety. And it's based on prevention rather than on inspection. Although the inspections prove that you have taken care of the hazards. So that will become part of it. But the reason that you are doing this is for prevention. And that's what your HICEP plan is going to show that you're preventing the hazards that you know exist. To do that, the deviations are detected, the control is reestablished in a timely manner, and you're making sure that hazard products do not reach the consumer. And the most important thing is HICEP systems must be tailor-made for each establishment, for each product, processing and distribution conditions within your manufacturing. So it's not a one size fits all. The high step plans will vary. They're specific to the product process and the facility. So if you do one product, you're gonna have one high step plan. You do 10 products, you're going to have 10 high step plans because it's specific to the product, the process, and the facility. Now, the generic plans, they're useful, but they have to be specific to your unique features. So when a HISAP plan is specific, it includes the following. Who are your suppliers? What are your ingredient specifications? Not asking for recipes here. We're asking for the ingredient specifications. The formulation, there again, this is not the recipe, it's how you put things together, the product specifications, the facility and layout, the equipment type and the design. Lots of firms make the same product using different equipment and in different designs. What are your preparation and processing methods? What are your employee practices? your packaging materials, your storage and warehousing, your distribution, your retail handling, and your displays, your product shelf life, your label instructions for consumers, 
and upper management financial support and motivation. All these things become part of your specific HISAP plan. So sort of the basically 12 steps in the application of the HISAP. Now you can put these down to the seven basic principles of HISAP, but these are what we basically put together are these 12 steps that individually have to be done. We can group them together and say in seven, but I left it as the 12 because I want you to see that each of these steps are specific that must be done and try to understand what they're asking you to do. So the five preliminary steps are assembling your HISAP team, describe the food and its distribution, describe the intended use and your consumers, develop a flow diagram describing the process and verify that flow diagram. You will see that some of these same things we talked about last week with the labeling. If you know the answers to this, it will be a lot easier for you to figure out what your labeling needs to be. I know in small businesses, they say, oh, we don't really have enough people for high steps and nobody really fits the descriptions of what we need for an in-house high step. Well, I would disagree with that. And that's why I tried to put out some, some ideas of what this is, an engineer. Okay, now the engineer knows your food manufacturing and your operations. You know, the processing, the production, the handling, the storage, the conservation, the control, the packaging, and the distribution. They basically know all of this. This is usually an owner of a company, might be a, a wife, a sibling, uh, whatever. But there is someone that knows your company inside and out. The production of it. This is the person that supervises your staff in production and the safe food preparation techniques. Who looks at the people who work there? Maybe you only have four people, but I'll bet you there's somebody that's determining how the production is done and the techniques that are taken. Sanitation, this is the person that cleans the premises and the equipment. On the quality assurance, who prevents the mistakes and defects in your products? Who avoids the problems when delivering the products or services to the customers? And the food biology. Now, this doesn't have to be a scientist that's on your group of workers. This has to be someone who knows the good and bad microorganisms that inhibit, create, or contaminate your food product. So as you can see, these people do exist within your processing unit. Describe the food and the distribution. What are the ingredients, the processing methods, the method of distribution, temperature at distribution? Is it frozen? Is it refrigerated? Does it have a shelf life? Describe the intended use and consumers. Is cooking required? Is it ready to eat? Is it made for the general public, for infants, for elderly? Remember, this goes back even to your labeling. You need to know this. So when you're looking to describe the foods and its distribution, answer the following questions. What is the product? What is the nature of the product? Is it fresh? Is it canned? Is it dry? What type of storage and distribution? Does it need refrigeration? Is it frozen? Can it just be put on the shelf? And if it can, what is the shelf life of your product? How is the product produced and processed? So here we develop a flow diagram for the manufacturing of it. Now remember, you need this for each of the products you do. All steps within the facility, a schematic of the facility is useful. Verify the flow diagram. Sit down with your employees, your team. Have we remembered everything here? Is there any other steps that we should put into this and modify our flow diagram? So here is a menu, uh, a processing. Okay, what are the steps that take you take, how does rubbish come in? How does waste go out? How does uh, packaging area? Um, what you're looking for here 
is how does food safety work within your manufacturing? And do you actually have a flow and it is the best flow for the processing of your product so that food safety is upheld and there's no cross contamination? Obviously, if you have raw materials and ingredients and you have them coming in the same place that you have your packaging area, you could easily get cross contamination. If you have showers and toilets and your laboratory in the middle, obviously there can be cross contamination there also. So this is important that you look at how the flow of your work goes to make sure that food safety is taken care of. That's part of your good manufacturing practices. It has to do with the cleaning and the sanitation, the standard sanitation operating procedures, the SSOPs, um, is part of your HISAP plan. How are you handling cleaning and sanitation? But you also need to know about your facilities, your supplier's control, the specifications, and the production equipment that you have, what is necessary for the cleaning of it. The sanitation uh, is used to exclude the biological, the chemical, and the physical hazards from high set. It helps assure the production of wholesome, unadulterated food. As we saw earlier, one of the food products that was on the rejection list was for adulterated food. Apparently they need to go back and they need to show the SSOPs and show that their sanitation is, is put in place so that the food has not been adulterated. It enhances the quality, the shelf life and the operational efficiency and it reduces your maintenance costs. But those are not things that we really care about in the HACCP plan. What we want to know is what are the cleaning of the equipment, the cleaning of your facility, your personnel practices, how do they maintain food safety, your equipment design and operation. Some pieces of equipment are almost impossible to get clean. So we want to know what steps you go to to try and make sure that cleanliness is done as much as possible, that you've controlled the pest. And what are your warehousing practices? I know that in some countries, it is important for the pest and the warehousing because there are mice in there and the urine from the mice cause a very deadly disease to people. So if it's on top of the container, say it's a container you're going to open and drink a juice from, it is important that that is kept clean. I just bought um, a product from Italy and it actually had a cap on the top you peeled the cap off and then you opened the bottle to drink. And I thought, wow, what a cool thing for this company to do to make sure that that can is clean for drinking. So we have the FDA and the USDA regulations. And the FDA recommends a written um, SSOPs for fish and seafood and the USDA mandates it for meat and poultry. And failure to comply with this can lead to legal or criminal action. So it must include all the daily procedures used before, during, and after to prevent contamination or adulteration of your product. It has to be signed and dated by the person with overall authority. Mandatory minimum pre-operational procedures that include the cleaning of the food contact services, the equipment, the utensils, and the frequency at which each of these steps is conducted and who is responsible. So this is not generic. This is specific on your um, processing. How is this done? They want you to describe, evaluate, and document your adherence, including the appropriate corrective action for direct product contamination and employee practices during the production. I have seen so many beautiful HACCP plans that have nothing about what has happened to evaluate it or do corrective actions. 
it is important that you show that at some times there have needed to be corrective actions. Write that in the back. If you have a beautiful high sap plan that nothing has ever been written on, it's a red flag. It means you really haven't utilized your HACCP plan and nothing goes perfect as we all know in life. And so it is the same with your HACCP plan. You might think you have the food safety under control, but there is always a surprise that comes up. So you need your sanitation control records to document the monitoring, you need the name and location of the processor. You need the date and time of the monitoring activities, the signature or the initials of the per person performing that operation. You should have sheets of paper that every time this is done, someone has to initial it or put their name on it. You need to identify the product that this was done for. And you need to maintain these records for more than a year for refrigerated products and more than two years if they are frozen, preserved, or shelf-stable products. Remember when we talked about labeling last week, we talked about how important it was that there was an address that they could find you because if something comes up and they need to um, relocate that product, how much product was there? Was it maintained? Was there um, a contamination that wasn't evaluated? Was there corrective actions taken? That's why these records have to be maintained because if there's a problem, they've located you, they need to see these records. So you need to list all potential hazards, you need to conduct a hazard analysis, and you need to control the uh, consider the control measures that are going to be necessary for this. So you define the product formula. That's the list of all the ingredients on the label. This alerts the HICEP team to the potential biological, chemical, and physical hazards associated with specific ingredients, such as salmonella, toxins, metal, glass, stones. You know, if you're importing beans, say, Quite often there's little stones or rice has stones in it if it hasn't been sorted. So these are things, depending on what the ingredients are, you will know what the potential hazards associated with them might be. You list other ingredients that might have entered your product is, might it be pesticides, chemical sanitizers, processing aids such as sulfites, so you develop the list of biological, chemical, and physical hazards that are reasonably likely to occur and reasonably likely to cause injury or illness if you don't control them. So you assemble a complete list of the hazards for the foods and the ingredients that you're working with. You've evaluated the hazard based on the likelihood of occurrence and severity and you define those hazards that are present for a significant risk that must be addressed in your high sap plan. So you're gonna consider the raw materials, the ingredients during the storage, the processing, product storage, distribution, and the final preparations. Review the ingredients, the activities at each step of the processing the equipment used, the final product, the method of storage, the distribution, intended use, and the consumers. A thorough hazard analysis is the key to preparing an effective HISAT plan and to showing the FDA that you understand and handle your contaminants. This is what they are looking for to get you off that red list. So I brought this up because I think it is important. When we talked last week about the labeling, we talked about common um, names also. Codex does include those. So go to the Codex Alimentarius, go to the food standards, look down that reference list for your product. There's a standard for honey, for canned salmon, for, for for preserved tomatoes, for applesauce, for fats and oils, 
olive oils. So go down that list, find what your product is and utilize it. The codex standards then, each one of them, there are 224 of them, there's 79 guidelines and 54 codes of practice for food products. So almost everything is listed in this. And if it's not, then you definitely need to be part of Codex because they probably are working on a standard and they need your input. But you're gonna look at what the description, the definition of that product is. Make sure that your product fits that definition. It's going to tell you what the quality factors are, um, the general and the specific, what moisture content should be, how much extraneous matter you can have, the contaminants that might be part of that, um, the hygiene, that good manufacturing product uh, practices that you should be using, um, appropriate methods of sampling and examining it, um, your packaging, your labeling of it, and the methods of analyzing and sampling it. Now remember, this standard is what's going to happen if you are ever in a trade issue. It's not the national food laws of your country or the national food laws of the country that is questioning it. It is codex standards that are going to be used. So make sure you understand your product within the codex. So here, when we talk about the codex, and this just happens to be one that I pulled up on pickles, but you will see this is parts and pieces of what's out there. It tells you the quality. So what is the sam uh, standard sample unit of 20 whole cucumbers or 40 halves? How many can be curved? How many should be blemished? How many should have an off color? You know, what are you allowed? The same when you talk about uh, rings or slices or strips tells you how big of a sample you need and how what the maximum limit is of a defect. Tells you the methods of, in, of analysis and sampling. It tells you um, the total acidity, the salt that needs to be put in it, the salt-free solubles in it. Now these are going to become your critical control points. The same with the contaminants. It knows that tin and lead are issues with pickles. So your critical control points have to include that you are keeping the acidity at this level and your contaminants are under those minimums. So it also tells you the hygiene. All these should be part of your HACCP plan and they're pretty well spelled out for you. So you don't have to go looking for them. They're already there. The USDA food specifics also have specifications. So you can go to this website, you can click on one of these, and they're going to tell you the specifications for the detailed standards that the USDA is looking for. Control measures. When you're putting your HISAP plan together, what you're looking for are control measures that prevent, eliminate, or reduce the hazards to an acceptable level. Nothing is perfect. We're not looking for perfection because as you could see before, there's a range of what is acceptable and there are, is a minimum that can be accepted. And you're going to control the measures by doing changes in the process, the product formulation, or operating procedures but the same product can be different at different facilities because you might have a different supply source, uh, product formulation might be different, the production methods might be different, effectiveness of your prerequisite programs might be different. So if you have multiple facilities doing one product, you need a HACCP plan for each facility. You're going to review the following, the raw materials, the ingredients you're being used. I'm going to suspect that some of the things like the chocolate that are said to be poisonous from Lebanon, that that probably has more to do with raw materials and the ingredients that's being used than it does with what the processor is doing. But you need to know the activities at each processing step, the equipment used in making the product, method of storage and distribution, and your intended customers. That is basically because if you are 
if you're the intended customer is a child or if it is an elderly person or if it is the general public or if it is a hospital that is using your product, these all determine what some of your hazards might be and they might be different and the, the labeling and the amount of hazard will be different. So you list all the potential biological, chemical and physical hazards that are introduced that can be increased or controlled at each step in the flow diagram. Biological hazards are pathogens associated with the ingredients uh, or your ingredients can support pathogen growth. The handling, manufacturing and storing um, might allow microbial growth and impact of mishandling the product. This could be something like um, cross-contamination. You are, your worker is handling one product and it goes to another product and they haven't done the correct um, hygiene in between um, and you end up with some contamination. Chemical hazards. These are associated with the growing, the harvesting, the processing or the packaging of the item. Food additives, um, they might even have been approved for intended use, but they still can have chemical hazards in them. The approved food packaging, we're seeing more and more about the chemical hazards of packaging materials. And I'm sure this is the PFAS and many of the food packaging materials are going to be looked at more closely. What you can utilize in the US is much different than what you can utilize in the EU. Most food packaging materials are coming from China. Um, there's some great questions of what is being utilized and what should be acceptable in those food packaging materials. If the food packaging material is approved for microwave use, sometimes uh, allowing the food package to be put into a microwave will um, cause some chemical hazards. Um, the labeling requirements that need to be done, the sulfites, the colors. We saw that some of the rejections were because of coloring. The food contact service, uh, surfaces, free of toxic substances. This goes back to your cleaning. The water quality and water treatment. I know Lebanon has problems with their water quality, and you have to address that in your HACCP plan. Same thing with even the food grade lubricants that you're using on your equipment. Some of them might be approved for certain substances, but not for others. So that needs to be looked at. Decide which potential hazards listed in the hazard identification is a significant risk to the consumers and needs to be addressed in your HISAT plan based on the severity and likelihood of occurrence. One of the ways you can do this is using a decision tree to address a determined hazard in your HISAP plan. So you go through the decision tree and say, does this step involve the hazard of sufficient livelihood of occurrence and severity to warrant control? If the answer is yes, it is a critical control point. If the answer Get, is the control at this step necessary for safety? Or does it need to be modified? So you're going through each one of these steps that you take to control the hazard and what are you doing and does it need to be adjusted? So this is going down to how does this subsequent step eliminate the identified hazard? or does it reduce its likely occurrence to be acceptable? So I put this together while I was working with Gari in an African country. And so um, we were doing local village production. So I divided into unintentional adulteration and intentional adulteration. Now in unintentional adulteration, we had heavy metals, water contaminants, unsanitary conditions, and communicable diseases. 
And we looked like, okay, how could we correct some of these things? So I put it to comply with the maximum levels, good manufacturing practices, good farming practices, testing for microbial and chemical contamination, safe water sources, uh, visual testing to comply with the maximum levels, obtaining food handler certificate showing tested for five diseases, unintentional. These are things that the people in the manufacturing had no control over. It was the pesticides, it was the oils, it was the enrichments, it was the soya, um, soybeans basically. So then it was like, okay, how could we comply with this and what did we need to do to handle that adulteration? You need to do this and you can put a page together like this, put it in your HACCP plan and it shows that you've actually gone through and thought about each of the adulterations that could take place within your product. This is your hazard analysis worksheet. Now this is a permanent record. This is not something you just jot down with a bunch of friends that are working in your plant and say, okay, we're gonna come up with this little worksheet. This is the list of ingredients, the processing steps, um, some of the hazards we're worried about, um, but you need a written record of your hazard evaluation, the severity and likelihood of occurrences. Not all hazards can be prevented, zero tolerance, but nearly all hazards can be controlled to minimize the risk. This must be developed after the hazard identification and evaluation. Multiple controls for one hazard. There might take more than one step for that hazard. There might be one control for multiple hazards, so it can go both ways. Now, there actually have been lawsuits um, where people have died of food poisoning, or there's been children who have been affected. And then when these lawsuits, they've actually asked for the hazard analysis worksheet. Did the processor know at the time that these hazards existed did they look at ways to prevent them or did they just ignore them? There, um, some of them have gotten mighty big uh, jail sentences and hefty um, financial um, slammed on them. So what is in this hazard worksheet is important. Take it seriously. Determine so when we're looking at these control points, we need to figure the parameter. What is the food safety parameter? How long does it have to cook? How long does it have to process? What temperature does it have to reach? What is the pH of it? What's the flow rate? Each of these things must be met at the critical control point. So you determine the proper standard that will prevent or eliminate or reduce the occurrence. Remember back in our pickles, they told us what the pH would have to be. So that's the acceptable level that we're looking for. There's performance standards. These are regulatory standards or guidelines. Milk pasteurization. We know that it has to be at 161 degrees Fahrenheit for 15 seconds or it's not pasteurized. We know that low acid canned food has to have a 12D reduction. So these are things that this is the standards we're aiming for. The critical limits must satisfy the capabilities of the manufacturer. Now, obviously someone who has a very big manufacturing process versus someone who is doing a small processing at home those are different capabilities, but you still have to continually monitor and check for the performance standards being met. You're going to do it differently based on your capability. So critical limits are established by tests and exper experiments. So this is where utilizing something like the codex or an international food law is important. Those tests and experiments have already been done and determined. So your job is to monitoring your processing to keep it within the established critical limits. You must provide for reliable, definitive information whether that critical limit is being met. 
So measure the product temperature after you cook it. Measure the oven temperature. What is the conveyor belt speed? What is the product thickness? These are things that can be measured and make sure that they're accurate and put into your HACCP plan. It must describe your monitoring processes and the frequency that you are monitoring it. That information must have a date and a time and be entered into your records. And the person that conducts it must sign it or initial each entry on that record sheet. So the corrective action plan ensures that no unsafe product enters the commas, ensures that the cause of the deviation is corrected. That is probably the most important thing. Everybody makes mistakes. Sometimes we have to take some of the food that we have processed because we have found that from this time to that time, it was not handled correctly. We need to put that into our HISAP plan. This has been a modification we made because we found out that the corrective action we thought was going to work doesn't work. So the corrective action records must fully document the actions that you took. In-house testing allows companies to be vigilant and alter their practices immediately to reduce the risk of foodborne illness and product spoilage. We also demonstrate how implementation of microbial testing and worker education creates a culture of food safety within the processing plant. Now these in-house testing kits are not what you would normally get at the Chamber of Commerce for exporting. You do not have to be certified for this. This is an in-house quick test that you can do your own uh, testing on your product and say, okay, our high sap plan says that our pH of our product has to be this. We put it in, it's correct. And we put time and date and sign it into our plan. We can say, we're looking for salmonella. We see a lot of the products we're asking for this. Okay, we test it for salmonella. We test once a month, we test once a week. Whatever it is, we put it in and say, our testing kit said that we didn't have salmonella. But if it shows up, because salmonella is everywhere. It, it grows in the ground, it's in the dirt. Um, so I, it's there someplace. The question is, where is it in your process that it needs to be fixed? You might find salmonella at the beginning of your process. You might find it in the middle. You might find it in the end product. Okay, where did it come from and how can we correct it? That is the things we're looking for to tell the FDA that we have a high set plan in place. This was a mistake because we're on top of this and we know how to do it. And you know we will recall that batch and we will make sure that the product we are sending for shipping will meet your standards. So the USDA regulation requirements are that we have a written description of the corrective action in your high set plan. You see the cause of the deviation has been identified and eliminated. The critical control point has been brought back under control by a corrective action. The deviation is prevented from recurring again. You have had a training session for your employer employees. You have added another step. What has it been that you have done and made a deviation? so that no unsafe product has entered commerce. You can segregate it, you can hold it, you can test it for safety. Determine if the deviation unforeseen hazard needs to be included in the high set plan. I have usually found that any time that you have had a deviation or a hazard has shown up, it does need to be included in your high set plan. This isn't we want a perfect high sap plan. This is, we want to see that you know what it takes to make the hazard corrected and go away. So it should always address what is reasonably likely to occur, a hazard for which a product, a prudent processor would establish control because it has occurred because there is a reasonable possibility of the hazard occurring in the product being processed 
in absence of control. So if you have gotten on the red list for salmonella, it is now established that you need to have a control for salmonella. So the verification by our regulatory agency is going to be a review of your HISAP plan, your critical control records, your critical limits, adequacy of corrective action following a deviation, and they can ask for other records. They can also act for, ask for a direct observation or measurement at your critical control point. How are you actually doing this? Um, they can ask for a sample collection and an analysis, or they can even ask for an on-site observation. You will see in some of those rejections that one of the things that they didn't get, they requested an on-site um, observation and they didn't get it. So when you say that you are going to ship, you are basically saying, yes, our doors are open and you can come look. This is because the WHO on food safety, according to the SPS agreement, has a right to apply measures to protect humans animals and plants, life and health. So that means if you're making animal food, this covers you too. It covers decrees, regulations, testing, inspection, certification, and approval of your procedures and your packaging and labeling as requirements directed, directly related to food safety. So foreign supplier verification programs. That's another thing that um, I think you're probably looking at. Um, instead of just sending your product that has already been utilized and processed and bottled and ready to send off for consumption, a lot of people are looking to become foreign suppliers. And we are getting companies within the US that are get, they are responsible for this and they are getting on their red list of the FDA because they don't feel that they are doing a good enough job about making sure that their importers um, are meeting um, applicable FDA food standards. So this kind of goes out of the FDA and goes to the foreign supplier that you are using. It requires that the importers verify their suppliers are producing food using processes, procedures that offer the same level of public health protection um, as the preventative controls requirement in the preventative controls and current good manufacturing practices rules for human and animal food. So this basically is that instead of the FDA taking responsibility for the inspections, the person that you are shipping retail to um, in bulk quantity is taking that responsibility. So they are going to ask, most of this is done uh, through inspections that are a review of your records rather than an observation. So that's one reason your HICEP is important to the person you're importing to. Um, but Inspections can be done at the importer's place of business. Um, some are required um, to provide the records electronically to the FDA. So say they you imported to someone in the US raw materials, they use those raw materials, they got caught for salmonella or some other thing that they, contamination that they weren't planning on. Uh, FDA then said, okay, we want to inspect your foreign suppliers' um, records, and you can send them to us electronically. So that means you better have your HISAP plans prepared so that they can be sent electronically to the supplier. So um, they, the division of foreign supplier provides a way to get information about foreign suppliers to help ensure that they are meeting U.S. safety requirements and thus keeping food safe for U.S. customers. So the FDA is not authorized under the law to approve, certify, license, or otherwise sanction individual food importers, products, labels, or shipments. So basically when you say, can I get approved by the FDA to take, you know, ship my food, they're not authorized to do that. 
they, uh, importers can import food to the US without prior sanction by the FDA, as long as the facilities that produce, store, or otherwise handle the products are registered with FDA and prior notice of incoming shipments is provided to the FDA. So imported food products are subject to FDA inspections when offered for import at US ports of entry. They may detain those shipments of products offered for import if they are found not to be in compliance or if they suspect that they are not in compliance because imported and domestically produced foods must meet the same legal requirements for food in the United States. The FDA Food Safety Modernization Act, FEMSA, um, is, is fairly new, it's changing, but still it allows the inspection of facilities. It uh, requires food facilities um, registered with the FDA and renew those registrations every year. It provides FDA authority to suspend the registration of food facility in certain circumstances. If you determine, if FDA determines that the food manufactured, processed, packed, received, or held has reasonable probability of causing serious adverse health consequences to either humans or animals, it can suspend your registration. FDA may by order suspend the registration of a facility that created, caused, or was responsible, um, or knew of, or had reason to know of, um, for any food that might cause um, a health issue. So if you're looking for procedures and requirements for importing food products, these are, these are, you should, I think, get these by the internet. And so you can click on these and I have the hyperlinks on this. So if you're interested in the prior notice of imported food or seafood or HACCP or third party certification programs, um, you should be able to click on these and go directly to the FDA sites. Um, actions on food facility registration. Here again, I hyperlinked these, so you should be able to click on those and get information that you need for that. Um, these are guides to assist for the online registration. So based on some of the needs that you might have, hopefully you can hyperlink these and get on where you need to be. This is another one on how to start importing FDA regulated products. Uh, products. And if your shipment is on hold, this is where you can go to find that information. So hopefully you learned something on this. And if I didn't give you the information, hopefully those links are available mm -hmm. to you now. So the things that you're processing is important, um, your processing, that you should be able to get some of the answers that you're looking for. It's a very difficult um, process to go through. There is no one size fits all. It's one of the reasons I don't like doing these um, webinars because I really can't help you individually. All I can do is give you the general information and give you some links that I hope that you can go to and find out your particular problem and find a, an answer to it. But thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it.